let's uh, start exploring uh, basics of recording an intracardiac ablation as part of online EP learning. This is Dr. Srivatsan, uh, Commander Srivatsan from Mayo Clinic. We're going to talk about unipolar sensing first. And here is a, a, a schematic of a myocardium. Here is an interrogating electrode as an arrow. Let us see this is the vectorial spread of an electrical impulse. And if it is coming towards the recording or interrogating uh, electrode, you will, and as an anode, either as the can in case of the pacemaker or a Wilson's common terminal in the electrophysiology lab, as the impulse comes towards the interrogating unipolar electrode, you will have an upstroke from the isoelectric line. And as the impulse crosses here and leaves the electrode, the electrical impulse then would actually produce a this portion of the electrogram would be recorded, which in turn tells you that the unipolar sensing, as long as the wavefront is coming towards the electrode, it will be positive. The moment it leaves the electrode, it will produce a negative deflection. Now, this can be seen in a source vectorial content of unipolar electrogram in an isotropic substrate, which means there is a no uh, linear uh, uniform conduction velocity along the substrate. Obviously, the heart has uh, some areas which, which is linear and isotropic. There are several areas which are anisotropic. So it is very difficult to say from pole A to pole B, it will be very uniform within the heart. But if you were to catch the Bachmann's bundle, which is an isotropic substrate, for example, then you might get this kind of a spread. And if your if you're uniform uh, unipolar interrogation is from this location, you will end up producing a a QS complex. On the other hand, if you're interrogating unipolar electrode is at point B, you will have a biphasic electrode. Part of it was coming towards, and the moment the, uh, the activation wavefront leaves the electrode, you will get the negative component. On the other hand, at uh, interrogation point C, everything will be positive as the entire electrogram is coming towards the electrode. So in terms of spatial localization, unipolar electrogram is far superior and it is somewhat challenging to find out where in the bipolar electrogram actually the local activation takes place. So whenever the uh, ablation electrode is moved around within the chamber to understand the, uh, to catalog all the points of localization of arrhythmia into a geometrical shape, such as uh, vendor provided in a, uh, geometry, such as either cardo or an avex or arrhythmia, the generally unipolar localization for a given point is better rather than utilizing bipolar electrograms. Um, uh, So in terms of a pacemaker or even a regular bipolar electrode, which is uh, interrogating, how is a bipolar electrogram obtained compared to an unipolar electrogram? Let's assume the red is the tip of either the interrogating bipolar electrode and the green is uh, the uh, ring in case of a pacemaker. In case of a uh, quadripolar electrode that is recording in the heart, you can take the red uh, 
and the white will form one component of the distal pair of electrodes and then this red and that will be this small white component would act as a proximal portion of electrodes. So supposing the obtained bipolar electrogram is a tip electrogram from the red to the grounding electrode. In the case of the pacemaker, it's the CAN. In the case of electrophysiology lab, it is the Wilson's Common Terminal. You get a large, rather large antenna which produces a pretty big electrogram. If you record it from the green, which is the ring, this kind of an electrogram is obtained because the spatial orientation to the activation of the electrical forces is different for the tip compared to the ring and is going to record a different electrogram. What normally happens in a bipolar electrogram is the red minus the green, you get a bipolar electrogram and that is what is displayed. This is digitally subtracted and you really have no idea what the tip and the ring electrode are actually doing. You only get the bipolar electrogram. This bipolar electrogram is of acceptable amplitude. If the tip electrogram minus the ring electrogram is rather a large, not rather a large electrogram, that means the tip is usually big and the ring is seeing something different, which means something big minus something small will end up producing rather big electrogram. One of the issue that would happen is look at the phase shift. The local electrogram is having something like this. Obviously, a electrogram somewhat removed from the site or space is recording something different. And the bipolar electrogram is completely producing a phase shift. And this is why in localizing electrogram, if you take this point as the local site of activation, it becomes rather challenging because this is not the actual site of local activation. If you take this as a site of local activation, it is very difficult. So this is why the bipolar electrogram always has challenges in predicting where the spatial activation under the electrode took place. But in terms of pacemaker recording, if your ring electrogram and your uh, tip electrogram are of equal amplitude, the bipolar electrogram will be exceptionally small with rather a, a small slew rate and that would make the pacemaker challenging to see what is actually happening. So either you may have to change the amount of uh, curve or location or J on the electrode to produce a better, um, uh, better amplitude of the bipolar electrogram because both unipolar and bipolar are nearly the same amplitude. It becomes a, a very small bipolar electrogram with an accept slew rate. So let's talk about what is a slew rate. Here is the max amplitude of the electrogram recorded. Here is the time taken to achieve this electrogram. And you can take a slew rate of delta V, which is the total amplitude change, over delta T, the time it took to achieve. And you see in most computer sensing algorithms are better applied if you're uh, at around 0.5 volts per second is where they sense the best whether it's atrium or ventricle. But because of the mass of the myocardium under the atrium is smaller, generally the recorded atrial bipolar electrograms are between 1.5 to 2, and for the ventricle is between 5 to 6 millivolts at the time of implantation. And over time, these things can change from healing process, sometimes scarring, sometimes the orientation of the electrode can change. So The amount of uh, or amplitude of the electrogram recorded 
would depend on the mass of the myocardium. Did we screw in the lead <coughs> into an unacceptable tissue such as fibrosis and the orientation of the electrode to the axis of depolarization? So although this may look very good numbers at the time of implant, over time they can change. If they change the very next morning, then you have probably a micro dislodgement of some kind. Many of the micro dislodgements would present as adequate sensing but poor capture amplitude in terms of micro dislodgement. Bipolar recording depends on the tip to ring orientation to the activation different. So when we have a slew rate of sensing, for example, if you have a slew rate of 0.5, you, you know, in terms of an R wave, you really need to have a, a, a 5 millivolt R wave because beyond 0.4 sen, a slew rate, it, it has a tough time seeing uh, that wave. But when you have a slew rate, which is rather uh, exceptional at 0.1, you can really sense 1.25 millivolt. And of course, if you have a slew rate of 0.2, so it depends on how good your uh, processing capabilities are. If you have exceptionally small slew rates, you can sense the very small waves. And in fact, many of the newer pacemakers, particularly for the atrial deflections and depolarizations, they have a very small slew rates uh, then with that way they can even pick up a small uh, wave. But for example, if you program a slew rate of 0.5 in an atrial electrogram, which is only 1.25 millivolts, and the uh, and the uh, amplifier is only capable of sensing at 0.4, it might not see the wave and may pace the patient when there is an actual atrial electrogram. That's why you may require a smaller slew rates to see what exactly is happening. But once you obtain signals, the signal amplitude and the frequency, you do need to have bandpass filter them. What is a bandpass filtering? So for example, you don't want to see the T waves and so you end up filtering the T waves and you also end up filtering the muscle signals which are generally of high frequency and you want to see the this is the core amplification core frequency representation the p waves and the r waves are ideally seen somewhere between 5 to 50 <coughs> but in the ep lab we generally filter between 30 to 500 uh, we have low high pass at 30 and low pass at 500 uh, and that is not uncommon but in terms of unipolar we open the gates from 0.05 to 500 even uh, that is for entire far field recording which means the shutter is wide open this is like letting taking photography in a night photography you want to see every bit of the light so you open the shutter uh, completely and the frame rates are slowed so you can see everything similar representation here and so you see a lot of uh, the field but you can try to subtract the far field even in a unipolar electrogram by programming it to 30 to 500 so it depends on what exactly you want to see one of the problems with the unipolar electrogram in opening up 0 0.05 to 500 that you will get a QS complex for a focal arrhythmia in a large area. So realistically, it is not very precise when you open it, open the gates so much to see a large folk, a large field area, and then you will not be if you because you get it in such a large area, ablation in that location may not be successful unless the bipolar EGM shows a sharp near field high frequency deflection much earlier than the onset of the arrhythmia in which case it may be very high.
So why do we filter? We want to improve the signal to noise ratio. We want to remove T waves, remove after depolarization in games of pacemakers, skeletal muscle potentials. We want to attenuate the far field electrograms. And most importantly, we want to amplify and, re, uh, and enlarge on the co-frequency of interest during the case. The filtration may also stop baseline drift. Particularly if your lab is not very well grounded, you could have a, a baseline fluctuation like this whenever you start auto fibrillation. And you can uh, raise uh, at the, during this high pass filtration can be raised from 30 to 100. Even though the number is 30, uh, it is high pass, uh, uh, it is called the uh, high pass and uh, 500 uh, because it's based on wavelength, right? When you have 30 heads, the wavelengths are large. So it is uh, called high pass and when it's 500, the wavelength is really short. It's called the low pass because for 100 milliseconds, uh, 1000 milliseconds divided by 500 uh, events per 1000 milliseconds gives you a two millisecond event at 500 hertz. So that is a very short wavelength. On the other hand, at 30, as a nearly 30 point something in terms of the wavelength. So that is why it is called uh, the high pass because it has a higher wavelength. So you can see that you can stop the drift. You'll only see these two, uh, these two waves only. So it is automated but manual in echo, but generally reject button is not of significant use. Now, we are a majority of the modern labs have 128 channels, so you can plug in a lot of things. Amplifiers gain an amplitude up to 10,000, although noise may interfere. The high pass filter is done to stop baseline drift, and you may have to adjust sometimes between 30 to 100, uh, you, depending upon the grounding in the lab. Then we have an isolation amplifier, meaning isolating the elect electrogram from mainly the patient. The low pass filter is to remove environmental uh, noise. Uh, and then you have a notch or a gain. Supposing your lab is converted from a cath lab into an EP lab and it is not independently grounded from the building, it's not uncommon to get a significant amount of noise on the uh, catheters and you may have to put notch filter on. Although personally I prefer not to put the notch because sometimes you may miss potentials as you try to filter the 60 hertz um, out of the electrogram. In Europe it is 50 and in the United States it's 60 hertz. And then there's an analog to digital converter. Which actually displays. Now analog to digital display, uh, you know, today with this is, in the old days, it was 16-bit, but with Windows 10, we have 64 bits. You can see how many uh, things can be processed in a matter of very quick time. And the sampling rate uh, is 1,000 hertz for 64 channel. So net sampling rate achieved is 64,000. So if you have a 128 channel, they have 128,000 hertz would have to be processed and that's why the processes and capabilities are ever rapidly increasing which makes it uh, quite significant. So one kilohertz is sweep speed of 200. Uh, I particularly don't like 400 meters per second because I think temporal resolution would be lost if you really stretch the signal too much and whatever uh, everything will look very far fieldish. So I think the EP lab general capabilities are around 200 millimeters per second, which means five milliseconds is the event that can be very pre somewhat uh, pre uh, precisely can be obtained. Beyond that, it becomes fairly challenging to see what exactly happens. We also have to consider electro diameters and spacing and electrograms. If you have a narrow catheter with a two millimeter spacing, which is considered a very narrow spacing, uh, 
it is called uh, low um, a less noise closer spacing leads to less far field recording because you're filtering essentially the same uh, you know, the tip to the ring kind of concept which we alluded to earlier you'll have a shorter duration of the electrogram so less of the far field two millimeter spacing is recommended of course you can go even smaller than that if you and a very tiny electrode such as penta ray uh, is it's possible but you also have to consider that each pole is actually making contact there is uh, uh, you know it is uh, sometimes they may not even touch the electrode and may produce uh, electrograms and then we're using it for our catalog so luckily they have automated deletion nowadays available but nevertheless you have to be aware or cognizant of all these issues supposing you use a bigger electrode such as an 8 millimeter or even 10 millimeter tip in the old days you'll end up producing a lot of noise it's very difficult to record a fine electrogram for example recording a hiss out of a 10 millimeter tip electrode is much more challenging than a uh, two millimeter electrode uh, uh, especially an octopore or catheter will be a lot easier with two millimeter spacing to record the hiss than an eight French uh, five millimeter spaced electrode uh, it will be uh, may make it more uh, difficult thing that we need to look at is generally in the EP lab the norm is to paste from the distal pair of electrodes and record from the proximal pair of electrodes so many times this will be the one that will be displayed on the monitor and if we hit uh, P to select pacing and then paste out of this one pace that, and therefore you should have the multi-channel enabled and this should be highlighted already so you're only using the Pruka to select the channel to paste rather than hitting P every time uh, particularly for high right atrium and right ventricle this may be the norm but for coronary sinus you can directly go to the electrogram and hit P this is uh, attempted in the past because one of the problems with entrainment is that you want to record from the pair of electrodes which are pacing because that is the electrode which is closest to the circuit to understand the post space interval um, the problem is the amplifier will get saturated because of the pacing output and you will get a significant uh, um, artifact from uh, pacing induced stimulus and it, you might not see the local electrogram and the stim itself may be extremely wide and this was challenging so there was an attempt to make the pacing electrodes from pair 1 to 3 and recording electrodes from 2 to 4 so that way the recording electrode is not spatially removed too far from the pacing electrode but unfortunately this did not pan out very much and I think this convention continues to prevail in the lab so we amplify the signal we filter them we rectify them automatically and eventually we display them the display frequency uh, in a VGA monitor uh, is about 80 to 100 Hertz so there are limitations uh, the only uh, thing that is faster than this is the M mode echocardiography which can record up to thousand frames potentially per second that gives you a resolution of one millisecond per event uh, typically in the EP lab anything less than five milliseconds is pretty challenging because a minor movement of the mouse may produce and it, in fact if you want to be precise if you want to have a higher precision to your measurements it's probably safer even to have 10 milliseconds or greater so some of the other technical considerations we said the 30 to 500 Hertz local activation has improved detection of low amplitude signals such as scar mapping whereas the QS proximity to source is not useful in a patient if you filter the unipolar electrogram between 30 to 500 on the other hand if you go from 0.05 to 500 the electrogram width will increase the cut because it is cutting all the low corner frequencies and of course it will end QS proximity to source is much more useful
but when you have a bipolar electrogram you end up detecting these kind of sharp near field high frequency electrogram better detection of this happens due to far field recording filtration so you have to use both in uh, in cumulative fashion to understand what exactly is happening um, so you this may be useful if you have a QS at 0.05 to 500 that you know you're in the region of interest but it is probably better to get a this kind of an electrogram ahead and ahead of even the surface complex for you to understand what exactly is happening so in terms of pacing lead we have a, a cathode and an active helix this is also electrically active and this anode is generally larger than the cathode so that the anode doesn't capture in the old days So you can see the active helix is about uh, 1.5 millimeters. Uh, this is a generally made out of, of uh, uh, substances which tend to reduce polarization. You typically get about 10 millimeter spacing. Wider the spacing, uh, better the electrogram. Um, but of course, uh, it, it becomes a challenge uh, in terms of um, stability of the lead and so on. So most of them have about <coughs> 8 to 10 millimeters. You have 11 millimeter spacing a lead is available in case you have a very challenging adult congenital heart disease patients and you can't record uh, an atrial electrogram because of prior surgery or baffle. You may choose a wider separated lead but vast majority of the time, 10 millimeter spacing should be enough. And the anode is about 4.5 times. Sometimes it can be eight times bigger just to reduce anodal capture. Anodal capture tends to have shorter refractory periods and proarrhythmic. Either it induces AF or VFib in the very old literature. I don't think anodal capture today, We majority of the time, we were seeing it in bi, uh, biventricular pacing particularly if RV ring instead of the coil was used as the uh, anode. But generally, most manufacturers have switched to the RV coil, which has a much larger surface area. So the current diffuses out over a large surface area, and the current density is low, so it does not produce significant anodal capture today. Uh, there is a, a inner coating of silicone and outer layer of some modification of PTFE, because the silicone handles better, but the PTFE is a little bit more cut and heat resistant. And many leads may discharge a small degree of steroids just to produce uh, this kind of exit block out of the lead because a local fibrosis has become much more, much less ever since. steroid impregnation and you can see that the high fidelity recording electrodes are better you can see that this sharp near field electrogram is from the coronary sinus muscle coat itself and then you have a far field left atrial recording which is present and so this kind of fidelity uh, you can see here too that there is a left atrial recording and then there's a near field muscle coat recording but it's a lot easier to see the between the muscle coat and the left atrial electrogram and you can also see the temporal analysis of the electrogram such as during sinus rhythm your right atrium is here and the his signals because uh, they have to cross some portion of the crystal there's some slight delay this is the atrial electrogram on the his septum uh, on the anterior septum this is the intra atrial conduction time from hyoid atrium to the septal atrium and then this is it goes through the AV node which we can't record to the his bundle and then from the his to the ventricle typically about 35 to 55 milliseconds in a normal individual with narrow QRS and the sum total 
is a PR interval. But if you can see here, there's a, some kind of a tachycardia that is going on. But during tachycardia, the atrial electrogram to septal, uh, his electrogram is only 13 milliseconds. But during sinus is 56 milliseconds. This gives you an idea that the atrial tachycardia focus is probably septal to the crystal terminalis. And that's why it has an easier access or quicker to reach intraatal conduction because it doesn't meet any barriers to conduction, whereas this one is meeting some kind of a barrier sinus rhythm to reach the septal atrium. Now, these are uh, obviously with multi-point mapping and recording, cataloging your points, you'll be able to uh, fo focus an area of interest where you would obtain high density points to make sure that the ablation is fairly successful. Uh, you should, once you have an area of interest, and it's an automatic tachycardia where the early electrogram is radiating from there on a map, you can take multiple high density points to improve the resolution of your map prior to ablation. You also can see whether the near field to far field uh, electrogram. For example, here is a patient with a left bundle branch block tachycardia, which becomes a narrower tachycardia with a shorter VA interval and the tachycardia in actually cycle and shortens consistent with the left lateral accessory pathway leading to tachycardia, which is, this is fairly diagnostic as we go through EP learning, we'll go through several of these cases. But you can see that the V to A interval is 150 and V to A interval is 87 and the AA correspondingly shortens here. Uh, all features suggest you have left-sided pathway. But the is issue is, is the, this was a previously failed case and why did it fail? Because they were, the ablation was performed in the left atrium. But you can see that they've created some kind of a local mitral annular block because the electrograms are splayed out at the level of the distal CS. But when you watch this carefully, the left atrium is occurring later and the, uh, the early electrogram is occurring at the level of the CS. That means it should have been ablated in the CS. This is a truly an epicardial pathway and not a regular endocardial pathway which bridges across the annulus. So the true epicardial pathways are generally inserted by definition into this, some kind of an epicardial structure such as coronary sinus and not into the left atrium. So mapping this in the endocardium may not be very useful. So these are things which you can obtain in terms of electrogram. So generally do not clip ablation distal electrogram because that's the business end of the electrogram and you're really interrogating with this. Adjust the gain in the CS to identify reliably near and far field. Crunch less important electrograms and have a larger display for ablation. Adjust the high pass filter if necessary. There's a lot of uh, In terms of RF ablation, um, you can see the very old DT ablation. And generally, when the cell achieves 50 degrees, there is irreversible loss of cellular excitability, uh, but there is a reversible loss. So when you are targeting an ablation and away from the actual source, and if your peripheral heat is about you know, 45 to 48 degrees on that given cell, which is causing the problem, it might temporarily suppress during ablation because of the higher temperature, but it will survive and will come back. And that's why you should be fairly precise and achieve greater than 50 degrees on the culprit cell to irreversibly produce uh, cell death and fibrosis so that the arrhythmia recurrence is uncommon. You can see, this is another form of representing the irreversible loss of excitability of 50 degrees and above, which is our general goal. So here we are having a unipolar ablation where the business end of the ablation catheter is touching a tissue, is discharging radio frequency energy. The reason why radio frequencies for regular electricity at 60 hertz will put the patient into ventricular fibrillation. 
whereas at the frequency or radio frequency, the heart doesn't see this and is captured on a cutaneous or, or external patch. Where, and we, the current density here is low because it's a very large patch and therefore the skin doesn't burn whereas the current density here is rather high because all the current that comes through to the patch has to flow through this small hand and that's why there is a resistance to the flow of current which causes local tissue destruction there is some conductive heating are beyond the area of resistive heating which all which will cause cellular depolarization but may not lead to real cell death and then the, obviously the blood flows are around the catheter calling convective cooling of the catheter so all this have to be taken into consideration because the current has to have a closed circuit the circuit is captured by the patch and returned back and this is the so-called unipolar ablation and of course um, the electrode may heat up and dissipation during heat so here is the area of resistive heating and you can see that there is some degree of uh, heat conducted from warm tissue into cooler blood so this is uh, convective and heat conducted from warm tissue into surrounding tissue expanding the lesion but these areas are generally they all will reverse after this ablation is stopped and this convective cooling via the blood this red area is likely to be the area of actual cell death with fibrosis and you know current density if you have a very large electrode and uh, such as 8 or 10 millimeter tip and use 50 watts versus 4 millimeter tip and use 50 watts clearly the 4 millimeter will have a much higher current density and the lesion will be much better on the 4 millimeter if the 50 watts is equally delivered on both catheters the advantage is that the 8 millimeter tip may you can program 70 watts and in 10 millimeter tips, people have tried up to 100 watts because the current density is distributed over a larger area. But generally in the EP lab, we don't program more than 65 to 70 watts. Uh, if it is not establishing the problem, you're not at the right location in general. And of course, the impedance, if you're uh, in a low blood flow area, such as the coronary sinus, your impedance may be higher. If you're caught into a crevice, it may be higher and the impedance starts rising rapidly that means you have some kind of a char formation so you need to watch the impedance trends while ablating uh, the patient the ohm's law is useful vc to ir and you can see that uh, the lesion formation 50 degree of irreversible loss happens about here but it is not going to go reach all the way to the epicardium because vast majority at about two to four millimeters of lesion uh, you may have some kind of a um, conductive heating may go up to five six millimeters but it is hard for that tissue to be irreversibly destroyed but in a 15 millimeter thick ventricle sometimes you may not be able to reach this why in non-ischemic cardiomyopathy or arvc which is an epicardium to endocardium disease not an ischemic heart disease which is endocardium to epicardium you may have to go outside the heart to a blade and you can see the temperature degradation as inverse square law it follows at the tip it may be the thermocouple measures a very high temperature the tissue temperature may be even hotter because the thermocouple is somewhat removed from the business uh, slight spatial removal from the actual delivery of the heat but as the distance goes away, the temperature decreases. And up to this, you may have cell death, but beyond that, you may not have any cell death. And there are what sub uh, materials are used for measuring. One is a thermocouple, the other is a thermistor, a device consisting of two dissimilar metals when joined at one end, which produces a small, unique voltage at a given temperature. As the temperature is rising, the unique voltage will change you measure the unique voltage but inversely represent the temperature live on the screen in case of a thermistor it's a, a device consisting of a small piece of a semiconductor whose electrical resistance changes with temperature here instead of two dissimilar metals they're using a semiconductor 
and that electrical impedance changes with temperature so you measure the impedance and inversely represent the temperature on the screen so who uses thermocouple and who uses the thermistor so you can see the ept catheters use generally thermistor and the biosense webster and st jude generally use thermocouple uh, in these days most of them are using thermocouples to measure within the tip electrode and uh, whereas in EPT, uh, it is uh, it's somewhat spatially removed, but they are delivering energy around it. And in case of the EPT, it is uh, definitely moved closer. To the tip so the temperature impedance trends of the catheters may different differ on the same patient depending upon the manufacturer so the thermocouple is self-powered simple fast and rugged inexpensive wide variety and wide temperature range it's high output and fast uh, in case of thermistor changes are much more uh, quicker uh, the disadvantage is thermocouples uh, references required less stable less sensitive the thermistor may be somewhat non-linear you can see the temperature may uh, somewhat fluctuate sometimes uh, its current source is required inconsistent from vendor to vendor but both have withstood the test of time and also depends on the orientation of the electrode to the measuring location And ideally, uh, it should touch. And in terms of power con control ablation, we will deliver preset power regardless of the temperature. And the temperature may vary, it may be 50, it may be 100, it may be 35. Whereas in temperature control, as soon as the temperature is reached, the power is shut down or power is fluctuated to maintain the temperature. So you may deliver five watts to achieve 50 degrees in a low blood flow situation. It may not be really be ablating tissues. So both have advantages and disadvantages. It usually causes a lot of power, causes like more of a de deeper lesion and high temperature, low power actually causes fairly superficial lesion. And this is, in order to overcome these issues, people have started doing the open irrigated tip where the it's essentially a form of a power control ablation because you're fooling the thermocouple by pushing cold saline so it thinks the temperature is low and deliver the pre-desired power and so you uh, so the argument is do we even need the thermocouple if we're going to constantly fool it but obviously the tissue temperatures may be much higher compared to what the thermocouple is seeing this is one of the problems with open irrigated ablations and of course you have an area of necrosis and inflammatory cell and sometimes you may not get the ablation successful in the lab but the next day uh, it is successful because of this but you or next few days but you don't want to be depending upon inflammatory reaction to take care of the problem it's better to resolve it in the lab one area the skin electrode position matters if you put the skin electrode too far away from the heart such as the thigh and the uh, you, you see you can put the base it is you, you the intervening tissue between the ablation electrode to the skin patch is minimal then it's much more predictable impedance and the lesion depths are much better if you increase the intervening tissue by putting the grounding electrode far away from the back of the patient where the heart is to the thigh or somewhere else then the lot of variable tissues are in between and they may wait, fluctuate in be impedance and the ablation lesion depth change quite a bit and you, uh, you can see the large tip electrodes uh, generally but if you're programming the same wattage but in expanding the tip electrode the current density would go down so it's the also the same thing the manufacturer recommended irrigation is better rather than programming this is the old format of course with the uh, 
uh, high flow pattern that the current catheters are different. But if you're they are recommending 17 ml and you're perfusing 30 ml, the lesion size actually goes down. It doesn't increase the lesion size because some of the heat are, is dissipated in the saline that flows out. So the, the, the reason why they program certain limits is that is the optimal size lesion achieved. So it is better to follow the manufacturer recommendation because they've gone through a lot of animal studies to come up with the numbers. And of course, impedance rises rapidly, more than five to 10 ohms. Uh, it is uh, better, it's actually better to gradually up titrate the uh, output, especially if you're ablating in critical structures such as aorta, no point in deliver, directly delivering 50 watts and 65 degrees. You can program 60 degrees, but it raise the amplitude slowly to make sure the impedance are within range before you keep rising the outputs. Now, uh, obviously, there are contact force sensing has been a big issue. So I can show you that the two competing variables now, one is spring loaded, the other are three optical fibers and the tip touches the tissue, the optical fibers bend, and the tactic cat software calculates the changes in the wavelengths between the three optical fibers. And see how contact force is measured every 100 milliseconds, but displayed continuously. And because 100 milliseconds is such a short duration, you can say this is virtually a real-time representation of the what contact force is happening. But in this three, the spring coil with three magnetic signal sensors, mechanical deformation of a coil uh, leads to positional change of sensors. Spatial location of sensors used to calculate contact force. The contact force is calculated every 50 seconds, but they don't want to give you the real-time measurement. They average it over 1,000 milliseconds for a second and display them continuously. So there is... Uh, what you get in the cardio biosense Webster catheter is an average over the last second. Uh, and they say practically it doesn't make a big difference from a sec for a second uh, versus real-time display, what was obtained just now, 50 milliseconds ago. And I, I think it's reasonable to say that both are practically kind of equal. I mean, Although in terms of scientific sense, one is an average over uh, the other is a real-time display. I think in reality, the difference is negligible in real practice. Uh, so the, here is some data about showing contact force sensing definitely makes a big difference, particularly with the atrial fibrillation ablation because we're getting significant amount of recurrences out of this. And you can see the orange line is the the contact force, and the blue line is the inadequate uh, contact force sensing. And whenever you use uh, the dormant conduction and early recovery, it seems to be a big problem if you use very little contact and produce a lesion, versus you produce a uh, 10 gram or greater force. Uh, it, it, it's possibly the early recovery is really low. But on the other hand, the force time integral of 400, which is kind of commonly used, meaning a force of 10 over 40 seconds, uh, because a half time for lesion formation based on the older data is about 13, 14 seconds, it is possibly better to deliver 10 to 15 grams of force over 30 seconds rather than delivering 40 grams of force over 10 seconds. Although uh, there is no actual comparison between uh, this 400 obtained, 400 of FTI force time integral obtained in matter of 10 seconds versus the FTI obtained over 30 seconds, I think it makes a little bit more sense because the half time for lesion formation is about uh, 15 uh, seconds. It's probably better to deliver a 15 gram force over 30 so in summary, understanding RF ablation physics is critical in 